Sarah's going to be talking to us about using Apache Zeppelin to do the same kind of Jupyter Notebook style stuff at scale, which I think is going to be very interesting. Cool. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So, yes, I'm going to be talking about taking an idea to a product, um, so using Zeppelin uh, to build models. Um, I'll give you an introduction. Okay, so before I, I get into anything, I'm going to give you an introduction to Zeppelin. So this is Zeppelin. I decided I'm not going to put a PowerPoint presentation together because the whole point that I want to demonstrate is that by using Zeppelin or any other notebook like Jupyter, you can actually take out a lot of the extra work around presenting stuff and you can actually just present your code, your images, everything all together in one place. So I'm going to try and demo that out here today. Um, so Zeppelin is a notebook much like Jupyter. Um, it's part of Apache and it's also part of the Hortonworks stack. So it's definitely designed more with the big data ecosystem in mind than Jupyter. Um, it's a much newer product than Jupyter, and I'll give you a bit more comparison about it later. Okay, so today, in today's presentation, I'll first give you a bit of an introduction to myself and my presentation. I'm then going to go through the notebook way of working. So if you're using Jupyter, you're probably familiar with this, but it's fairly new to my team and me. Um, I'm then going to compare Zeppelin to Jupyter, because I think Jupyter is what everybody knows. Um, and then for the last part of my talk, I'm going to work through a bit of a demo. So I'm going to read some data with Zeppelin. I'm going to show some cool visualizations of the data. And then I'm going to show how Zeppelin can be used to build models. I've got a simple example. Okay, so you'll see there's a little bit of um, code so kind of thrown in between <laughs> the, the display here, but we'll work with that. Okay, so first off, I work for a company called Digitata. Um, we're a, a telecoms company, or a tech company in the telecom space, I guess. We have three main streams. The first is dynamic tariffing, and this is our sort of historical main, main component to Digitata. Um, we came from working in the pay-go market where we were pricing calls per hour and per cell, so dynamic tariffing on a cell and location basis. Um, but the dynamic tariffing is moving more and more towards pricing bundles um, and much more targeted subscriber um, offers. So we've moved away from that cell-based more towards subscriber-based. The second stream is Digitata Insights. Um, this is a, a marketing platform, really, a mobile marketing platform, um, which incorporates a gamification framework. So that started out with USSD gaming, but is also extended to apps now. And then the third component is Digitata Networks. Um, and this is a, a digital network builds tools for mobile operators to monitor their and manage their mobile networks. Okay, and then quickly a little bit about me. I've worked at Digitata for over five years. Um, I've been involved with Digitata for 10 years in total. Um, before that, I worked um, as a MATLAB consultant. So I bring that up because I, I think I've come from the MATLAB world and moved over to Python and I have to say that anything I could do in MATLAB, I think I can more or less do in Python. So it's, it's really a great free alternative to MATLAB. Um, and my background is I'm an electrical engineer. So in today's talk, the main technology I'm focusing on is Zeppelin, but I'll also be touching on a couple of other things. So obviously, Python wouldn't, wouldn't be here without that. Um, we use NumPy and Pandas, so I think they're the data science kind of standards. Um, then I'll also touch on a little bit of PySpark and some Spark MLlib, which is Spark's machine learning libraries. And for visualization, I'm using some matplotlib and Bokeh. If that's how you pronounce it, I actually have no idea. <laughs> okay, so kicking into the presentation. The, the notebook book way of working. So I suspect most of you are quite familiar with this, but uh, my team, we stumbled upon Zeppelin only a couple of months ago. So I've been working it with, with it for probably about three months but I really feel like it's revolutionized the way that we're working. Um, so the way we tend to work with a Zeppelin notebook is we'll come up with an idea, we'll go to a notebook, spec out the requirements of the idea at the top of the notebook, and then maybe create some paragraphs for how you see the, the, the requirements to get this idea actually implemented. Then the next step will be to go and actually fill in the code to make this thing work. So you can go step by step and get each little paragraph to work. Um, and sometimes, if you're just doing some ad hoc data analysis, that might be the end result. So now you've got a workbook with your visualizations, and you can present that to people, and that's that. 
But we have started to take this a step further even and are starting to consider using this in production. So um, we aren't very far down this path, but we're, we're getting there. So there are two ways you could consider using a, a notebook like this in production. The first is to actually schedule a notebook to run at some period. Um, in its most simplest way, you can do this in Zeppelin by just setting some cron scheduling um, directly in the notebook um, and have Zeppelin running on a server and it will just run as often as you want it to run. Um, and there's also an API to Zeppelin, so you could use something like NiFi to schedule it to run as you're required. Um, and then the second way that you can, that we are actually using Zeppelin in production, or at least it's not a product that's been released yet, but it's something that we're building, is we're building some of our visualizations on our data in Zeppelin, and we're then embedding iframes showing those visualizations directly into our front end. So customers will be able to interact with our visualizations, which are actually running in Zeppelin on the back end. Okay, and the things that I've really loved about working with Zeppelin like this are firstly that our analysis becomes so reproducible. So you can write a notebook and if you need to do something again three weeks later, you just change the dates and rerun it and everything is the same. It's also been really great for collaboration. So we have a test server running and we've got Zeppelin running there and all of us can work on the same test server so we can see each other's code. And a lot of what I'm presenting today is work that my team members have done that, um, that we can, we've all shared the, the learning. So it's allowed us to learn a lot more, a lot faster. And then it's great to demo. Um, so you don't have to specifically go and put something else together. You can just show your notebook and everything's in one place. Okay, and just my last point on this is what I've found working with a notebook is my old workflow. I'd use, use some SQL tool to go and fetch data, so Postgres Admin or RoboMongo or something, depending where the data is. You'd then copy the data, or I would copy the data into Excel. Um, I might build some kind of model in Excel sometimes. <laughs> um, other times you'd prepare the data and actually build a model in Python, so I'll, I, I like to use Spider. I guess that's coming from the MATLAB world. Um, and then probably put the results into PowerPoint or a document or something so that you can share them. Now I find that I'm using Zeppelin. I can do all of this in one place. So it's really reduced the amount of backwards and forwards. If you need to change something, you don't have to go back to the start and rerun everything. It's, it's just all in one place. So it's really fantastic. Okay, then the, the last, um, so how we are using Zeppelin in our team. Um, what I'm running today is actually running on a VM on, on my laptop, so I've got my own personal little Zeppelin environment. Um, but then we also have a test server set up at our office where all of our team members can use Zeppelin on the same environment. And there, if, if we need to run analysis on bigger data sets, it's a good place to do it. Um, we've, um, yeah, there's a cluster of computers behind, so there's a bit more processing power. And then we also are starting to get Zeppelin installed on some of our production environments. So um, that is really great because the data sets we work with can be quite big and to pull them across networks uh, is tedious, so if you can have the, the analysis tool right where the data is, it obviously improves things. Okay, so then a, a brief um, discussion between Zeppelin and Jupyter. So this is um, largely my experience of it. I haven't worked much with Jupyter, um, but I've chatted to people who have, and then also from reading a couple of articles about it. So in a nutshell, Zeppelin is a newer product than um, Jupyter. And it's designed for the Hadoop ecosystem. And it's also, I think, more than Jupyter, it's been designed for a multi-user enterprise use. Um, Jupyter, on the other hand, is much more established. Um, it's got support for a lot more languages than Zeppelin. But from what I've read, there's some components of Jupyter that could be considered a bit outdated. And I think that's where Zeppelin has a chance to, because it's new, it can um, come in a bit stronger on some of those points. So one of the cool things about Zeppelin that Jupyter doesn't have is you can have multiple languages in a single workbook. So I can run a little bit of Python and then some PySpark and then some Scala, all in a single workbook, um, which is kind of cool. Um, it's also got some really nice built-in interactive vis visualizations. So I'll be demoing some of that today. So you don't even have to use a library like um, Matplotlib or Bokeh. You can just um, use the built-in visualizations. They get you fairly far as they are. Okay, then you can also embed iframes, so I'll also demo that a bit later. I'm not sure if you can do that with Jupyter. 
And I think, again, the whole multi-user enterprise use of, of Zeppelin is, is a strong point of it. But I have to mention some of the, the weaknesses. So in my experience and from what I've read, Zeppelin can at times be a little bit unstable. So sometimes your PySpark hangs and you don't know why. So I, I think it's a new product and I'm sure those things will improve. Um, the other problem with it is that there's no path, or at least in version 0.7, there's no Python autocompletion. So I think if you're just writing straight Python code, probably Jupyter is much stronger. Um, but again, in, I've heard in 0 0.8, there is some autocompletion. I'm not sure if it's comparable to Jupyter yet, but that's something that will probably improve with time. Okay. So now I'm going to start getting into a demo of, with some real data and showing you some of the things you can do. So obviously with Zeppelin, you can pull data from anywhere, really. Um, we typically use Postgres. We've got a couple of customers running Hive, and then for some more real-time accessible data, we've got Mongo. Um, so I'm going to, in this demo, I've, I've fetched data from Postgres. Um, in Zeppelin, there are built-in JDBC interpreters, so you can actually just write a SQL query and fetch data. But how we typically fetch the data is either using Python libraries like PsychoPG or PyMongo, and I do that if I'm just working with a small data set. Um, and as soon as the data set gets a bit bigger, then I, I would use PySpark um, to query the JDBC queries in PySpark. Okay, now I'm going to show you some, some code and some results. So the first thing I'm doing here is just writing a SQL query to fetch some data. So you don't need to know the details, but this is just a long SQL statement. Um, it's nothing to that. And then I'm going, oh, I've used PySpark to go and fetch this data. So I'm not going to run most of this. I've already run it, but there are parts where I'll run a bit of it live. Um, so here I set up some database connection details, and then I can use um, Spark read JDBC to go and fetch the data. And um, I've printed out how much data I fetched. So in this demo, I'm using about 168,000 rows. I'll show you the data now and explain what it is. Um, and you can see there's some record of how long this took. Um, my query took about two minutes to run and fetch this data. So this is fetching data from one of our operators, which is a, net, um, a mobile operator in, in Africa somewhere. So, um, OK. Then I can display the data. So if I was working in Spider, this is probably what the data would look like, unless I went and clicked on something to look at the variable. And it's pretty ugly. You can't see anything. So I'll make that disappear. But with Zeppelin, I can now show it in a much more readable um, table format. So if I expand this just to show you the code to do this, I'm using um, Zeppelin's visualization library, which is called Helium, to print my data out as a table. So all I have to do is z.show, and I give it my PySpark data frame, and it prints out the data in this really nice readable format. Um, obviously, it's not going to show all 168,000 rows, so it's, uh, you can configure how many rows of, or how much data you want to show. And it shows it in quite a nice format. OK, then, because I'm going to use this data through the rest of my example, I'll just talk you through what the data is a little bit. So I've got 168,000 MSISDNs here. So an MSISDN is a, a, a mobile subscriber's unique number. So it's your phone number, basically. I have encrypted these phone numbers, so you can't try and call them. <laughs> um, then I've got some information. This, this data is over a 28-day peri period. Um, I've got the first date and the last date that the subscriber made a call. And then I've got the average total call duration over the period. So this guy called on average for 111 seconds per day um, over the period. Um, I've got some other call durations. I've then got the amount that he spent calling over that period, the average amount per day, and the average number of days that he was calling. So. If, that, if this um, voice active days is zero, it means he made no voice calls during the period. If it was one, it would mean he called every single day in the period. So this guy is calling two out of three days, if I look at the 0 0.6. Okay, and then I've got basically the same data for SMS. Um, so the SMS, the count of SMSs that the subscriber sent, the SMS active days, and then a repeat of this data um, for data. So I think this total data volume is in bytes. So some of the numbers are really small, um, but then there's some big ones too. Okay, so that's the data I'm going to be working with. Um, and then I want to show you some of the visualization options with Zeppelin. 
So, um, okay, I, I think what I'm showing you today, I hope firmly sits beyond this um, period of horrible charts, and I think you can really build some beautiful charts these days um, with libraries out there. Um, so the three I'm going to show you are, are Helium, which is uh, Ze Zeppelin's built-in library. I'll then just show you some matplotlib, because I think that's a, a very common Python plotting library. And then Bokeh, which allows you to do some more interactive plots. Okay, so behind this, there's a bit of data prep that happens, but I'm not going to show you that. I'm going to jump straight to the first visualization. So first I want to show you, what I've done here is actually the same as that table I showed you before. I've just said z.show some PySpark data frame. Um, and it gives me a table. But along the table, I didn't show you this earlier, but there are options to go and plot this data. So I can do a bar chart, or I can do a, um, a pie, pie chart, or a couple of other kinds of charts. And this is all without um, having to code anything. It's just using what's built in with Zeppelin. Um, so if we, we talk through this data, um, this is showing a histogram of the, the total call duration, so the subscriber's average usage per day. So you can see there's about 11,000 subscribers in my sample set who didn't make a call at all over the period I was looking at. And the average subscriber is making around 24 seconds of calls per day. Um, to contextualize this, I, I have a 100 minutes a month contract, which puts me sitting somewhere around 200 minutes, um, 200 seconds per day if I were to use my full 100 minutes. Okay, so we can look at a histogram of one, that's great, but I want to show you now how we can make this a little bit interactive. So, um, I've, another thing I've built in here is, uh, this is again using Helium, I've got a drop down where I can show any of the, the attributes that I pulled about the subscribers. So I'm going to change this now to show the total data volume of subscribers. Okay, and as soon as I do that, this goes and reruns the block of code, or it reruns this paragraph. I just want to show you how easy it is to do that with the code. So um, all I had to do was give, was prepare a name and a value for my drop-down list, and then I use the z.select, and I give it the name and the value, and I store the results of that select into a, a, prop, um, a variable, and I can use that throughout the rest of the paragraph and throughout the rest of the notebook, actually. So that's some really easy user, um, user interactions that can be built into here. And now you can see my, my chart is updated. And then I also want to show you these charts are also a little bit configurable. So here I've only got two columns, but if I had more columns, I'd be able to see all of the fields listed over here, and I can select what I want to plot. And here, what I can do is I can add the buckets into groups, um, and then I can remove one of my, it always does that, I don't know why. Um, so I can remove those subscribers using no data so that it will zoom in a little bit on the subscribers who are using data. So all of this is quite cool because it's not really requiring any code, so it's a great simple way to explore your data without having to go and code some, some plotting functionality. Okay. Then just a quick um, show of matplotlib, so this is a bit of a confusing chart, but this is just a scatter plot of my two properties, total call duration and total, da total data volume. So this is try to, trying to see um, the, the two, the behavior of subscribers together. Okay. Um, obviously, I couldn't do a scatter plot of all 160,000 of my points, so I've bucketed them. So the size of these um, dots on the scatter plot show the number of subscribers in each of the, the buckets. And you can see along the x-axis all the subscribers using no data. Along the y-axis here, subscribers who are using data but no voice. And then there's a scatter of people using a mixture of both. And again, matplotlib is completely uninteractive. There's nothing I can do with this chart. But by using Zeppelin's um, Helium interactive stuff, I can go and change what I'm plotting. So I can bring, make this chart a little bit interactive. Um, okay, then the last chart I want to show is um, you can now also use Bokeh. So this is just a box and whisker chart showing the active days of the subscribers. So looking at this, you can see this is a pretty voice-dominated network. People are using voice more than anything else. SMS is dying. I think we all know that. Um, and data is still pretty low. Um, I, I think this is a, it's a poor country, so people don't necessarily have smartphones, so that's still upcoming. And now with Bokeh, I can, um, this plot is now a little bit more interactive, so I can zoom in, I can pan around, 
um, and I can reset it if I want to. So that's immediately a bit cooler. Okay, so those are just three basic um, ways I can visualize my data here. The next thing I want to move to is using Zeppelin to build models. So th there's an art to building models, definitely, but in my experience, most of the art is at actually getting the data prepared. So once you've got your data scaled and prepared as you want it, then building the model is really simple. So if I show you this code, this is basically all I have to do to to build a model. So I've decided with the data I've got, the, the obvious thing to do with it is to try and cluster the subscribers into groups who behave similarly. So I have just built a k-means model to try and group the subscribers into similar buckets. So I set my number of clusters to four, um, and then all I have to do, I've, I'm using um, matplotlib, uh, not matplotlib, um, mllib, which is Spark's machine learning library. I've imported k-means, and I just call k-means and tell it to build me four clusters, and it does it. Um, so here are the results. Here are four clusters that I've built. I built my clusters off a subset of the columns that I showed you. So I just picked a duration, a call amount, and the number of active days for voice, and then similar for SMS and data. Um, OK, and you can look at the numbers. But it's, so what, what these numbers show is these are the, the, med or the centers of the clusters that I've built. So there are I suppose you can think of it as the, the average values for subscribers who fall into each of the clusters. But again, this gets much more interesting if you start to look at a cool visualization of it. So I built a radar plot showing, showing the four different clusters and how the subscribers are different. So immediately here, you can start to understand stuff about your subscribers. So I'm going to go through the clusters one by one. Cluster zero is showing subscribers who use a fair amount of voice. So their voice active days, their voice um, call amounts and their call durations are pretty high and they're using very little of anything else. So that's cluster zero and there are 46,000 subscribers who fall into that. Then cluster one is subscribers who are still using quite a lot of voice but these are the data subscribers so they're using quite a lot of data. Cluster two we don't really care about because there's only 2,000 subscribers in there and they look like a pretty low usage um, group of subscribers. They're not doing much. And then cluster three these are people who are using SMS, which is quite interesting, and there are quite a lot of these subscribers. So they're, they're using a lot of voice, but they're also using quite a lot of SMS. So, yeah. Okay, and that, that's all I've got to show in the modeling. The last thing I want to show is I mentioned that we can um, share iframes of this. So in this paragraph, I actually don't have any code. All I've got is some HTML, and I'm linking to previous paragraphs. So I've linked to the radar chart together with the bar plot from the previous um, example that I showed you. So it's quite cool that I can develop some kind of visualization here, or I can develop lots of different ones, and then I can or put them into a paragraph. And then what I can do with this paragraph is I can say link this paragraph, and it opens up, it gives me a, a link which I can then embed into anything really. Um, so that's, that's how we are starting to, to use Zeppelin in our production. So I can build this chart. I've still got all my interactiveness. I can zoom in if I want to. Um, so it's, it's really cool. Okay. So I think I'm a little bit ahead of time. But that's, um, in, so in conclusion, I, I think there were two parts to my presentation. The first is that I've showed um, some of the advantages of just using notebooks. So your analysis becomes much more repeatable. With Zeppelin, it's great for collaboration. So I mean, having all the co everybody working on the same server is, is quite powerful. And then it's easy to communicate the results of your data analysis. You can have the code right there. You can even, I mean, in a demo like this, you can change stuff. If someone asks you a question, I can make a little modification and run it, and it's really quick and easy. Okay, and then more specifically with Zeppelin, I've showed how you can read data, how you can visualize the data, and how you can build models. And the idea of this was just to inspire you to take a look at Zeppelin and see if it is something that can be helpful to you as well. Thanks. That's it. <laughs>
Hi, um, I was just wondering, what's the cost of running something like this in production? Uh, is it very resource intensive to run it on your test servers or yeah. can you get away with one of So servers? Zeppelin itself I don't think is very intensive, but obviously if you're using Spark, then that, that's where the, the resource intensiveness will, will lie. So yes, um, it is part of the Hortonworks stack, so then it would be managed with Yarn and, and all of that. So that's probably the best way to, to use it in production. Um, Um, just talking about collaboration, um, yes. what are the collaboration features in it? Do you have some sort of built-in version control? Or so there is some version control. I have to be honest, we haven't used it, but we should. Um, so I don't know how it works, but you okay. can you can uh, yeah you can do version control. Um, it doesn't. And I know Jupyter integrates really nicely with GitHub as well. I, I don't. It doesn't have have that. I would say it integrates uh, with it nicely. Would be. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. Thanks. I haven't. Um, I'm just interested in your organization. Uh, when you started to move to Zeppelin, because this is, I'm assuming, running on a Hadoop cluster? So sometimes, yes, but not always. Sometimes we do just run it. You can run it locally. Um, if you've just got a local Spark behind it, you can do that as well. Oh, yeah. But the power of it is on a Hadoop cluster, yes. So, so uh, in your organization, when you're moving to this, um, w was it you intimately involved in like having setting up Hadoop and Spark on like yeah. actual servers, or do you have uh, uh, other engineering help within the organization? Yeah. Just out of interest. No, we we have other other people in the organization who handle that, and just out of interest. So we we were going to make the move more towards Hadoop and and that environment. We were using Hortonworks. But we actually realized our data is big, but it's not that big. So we've now decided to stick with Postgres, and we found something called Postgres XL, which is a distributed version of Postgres. So you can run it across multiple servers. So that we were getting too big to have Postgres on one server, but we needed, say, three servers. We didn't need 100. So I think Hadoop is really playing in that really big data space, and we aren't quite there. Yeah. So I, I have a question. Um, I'll I'll bring you the mic in a moment. Um, my question is around uh, so the kind of production style application. So it's clear that you can deploy sort of data science-y or analytics type stuff in, yeah. and then distribute uh, dashboards to clients and things like that. Yeah. Um, also, you mentioned there's the scheduling functionality built in, so you could run things at regular intervals. Yes. What about, how would you go about uh, doing some kind of uh, so if you needed to make predictions on an ongoing basis for a call center which was selling products or something like that, um, yeah. w is there a way to use it in that context or in that kind of slightly more real-time predictive? Real-time, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I was just interested. Yeah. So, I mean, there is an API which I haven't investigated at all. So you might be able to, to pair it up with something. Uh, for our real-time stuff, we're using NiFi quite a lot, so that's the, the one that comes to mind for me. Um, so uh, you probably could um, have a NiFi block that calls the Zeppelin API and runs something. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that that would be that valuable though, because the advantage of it is really the visualization. So, so that's yeah. Um. Hi, um, I have a lot of friends that are uh, engineers that are very comfortable in MATLAB, and um, <laughs> I was wondering maybe if you could give me some hints of what I can say to them to encourage them to to try out Python. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's free. I don't know if, that, if that's not enough. Then, um, um, so okay, I have to, uh, what I've found difficult moving from MATLAB to Python is the typing. So in MATLAB, everything's really clean and uh, it's it's quite simple. Where in Python, you've got way more types, and so I find I'm always confused. What type do I have? And so that takes some time to get used to. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think. If, if you're just using MATLAB, then you really, you can do with NumPy and SciPy and even Pandas, you can do anything that you could do in MATLAB. Um, where I do feel MATLAB, there isn't really a competitor, is if you're using Simulink. So that side of MATLAB is, is much stronger. But, but if you're just using MATLAB for coding, then 
Python is better. And there's a big community out there, so the MATLAB documentation is exceptionally good. And again, it's all very consistent, where if you're using um, Python libraries, they all have slightly different style, and that makes it a little bit harder. But if you can use MATLAB, you're smart enough to use <laughs> Python. So yeah, it maybe takes slightly longer, but I think the, the cost of the MATLAB license um, and the saving in time, you, s you save a lot by moving to Python, even if you spend slightly longer in figuring things out. Um, for Zeppelin, uh, do you have the ability to like rerun a notebook later or schedule it somehow to update the data regularly? Um, yes, I, th I think you, you definitely could. Um, so, I mean, you can schedule a notebook. Um, so, as simply as just putting in something here. Um, and then you would have to have code to set the date you want to run it on. And yeah, then you could automate whatever. Yeah. Um. I'm more, int more interested in how does this workflow scale with more people being in the team? Yes. Like, okay. I, I imagine two or three could be fine, but then mm. w when the team is bigger, yeah. how can you make up a, a better workflow? Uh, you showed us some, some things like version control, but yeah. I'm interested more like... Yeah, so I, we are a team of four, so it's a pretty small team, so I guess it's okay. Um, so with, uh, with Zeppelin, you can have LDAP logins and um, you can set different permissions, so different users can see different notebooks and have different permissions. I think you can even set some users who can't edit anything, they can just run notebooks. Um, and then they also, so the way we've been running, which isn't great at this point, is that every, every user shares the same Spark context. And, but you can set it up so that different users launch their own um, Spark context. And so I think it does scale quite well. Uh, um, but yeah, we're a small team, so I can't answer that very clearly, I'm afraid. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Um, I have a question just on the dashboards you were showing. Um, yes. Do you mainly use those for reporting purposes, like for other business users? Um, and if so, sort of like, what is their engagement like with that? Do they literally just click around and see what they need to see? And then if they're like, oh, I need another view, please add so it. So at, at this point, we haven't really let anyone else work with what we've put together. So we would usually show it to them. We haven't let them loose on it on their own. Um, but I think we, we could get to that point. So we have demoed some stuff to some customers in Zeppelin and they've been quite happy with it. So I think often we used to land up showing people stuff in Excel and they would immediately think, oh, can't be that smart, it's just using Excel. And so as soon as they see something different, they are immediately more impressed. And, and the interactiveness also makes it nice to demo. But yeah, we haven't, haven't let other people loose on our visualizations just yet, but that is coming. Um, and there, we will probably do it by not showing them the whole notebook, but by how I showed, just linking to a particular visualization and letting them interact with that. Sorry, there was a question. Where was the... Ah. Mm -hmm. My bad. Hi, yes, um, so my question, I remember at the beginning of your um, talk you spoke about the interpreters can hang. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're using a Hadoop cluster and your Spark interpreter's hanging, that means all your Spark context needs to be dropped before you can restart the interpreter. Yeah. So isn't that a bit of an issue for productionization? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> so yeah, I think there are some issues. And I, so we, I think we, we will upgrade to 0.8 very soon, and I'm hoping that things will be better with that. And, um, yeah, I mean, often it's while you're developing something that things hang, so it's probably something you've done. So maybe once your code is production ready, it's, it's better. But um, yeah, we haven't let this loose too much in production yet. So yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Like. Uh, as a long-time Jupyter user, yes. uh, this, you know, in many ways, it looks like Zeppelin is like getting a lot of really common pain points uh, in Jupyter and okay. is addressing them. So that that's quite cool. Um, so okay. thanks for introducing me to it. Um, I have a follow-up question. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that you guys haven't been using this like dashboarding workflow too much, where yeah. you are sticking out frame uh, iframes out. But just to make sure I've understood correctly. 
you're linking to the visualization within a particular notebook. So if you say I had a scheduled task in that notebook to rerun it, uh, it would update, is that right? Yes. Cool, and then yes. do you know anything about the security implications? Like, could someone just mess around with the URL and get to a different visualization in the notebook, or is it yeah. quite nicely isolated? No, so there, there are those, those issues. I think um, that's something we are still looking at. Um, for, for us, all of our stuff is running on a VPN, so uh, the environment itself is, is quite secure. But, but yes, so if someone got access into it, they could get into a notebook and write any Python code they wanted to. So there, there are security issues. It's, we're, we're hoping that our, our security on top of this will be what keeps it secure rather than Zeppelin itself. Code injection is a feature. Yeah, code injection is a feature. <laughs> Okay, are there any more questions? There have been some good ones. Cool. Well, in that case, I'd like to thank Sarah again. Um, yeah. Thank you.